Kyle uh, by phone and Jordan Truitt by phone slash webinar. Okay. So, Mr. Vice Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Well, I have, um, well, first of all, are there any agenda modifications? Mr. Vice Chair, there are no agenda modifications at this time. Okay. So, I have the following announcements. Um, comment registration cards for tonight's hearing are available on the table in the back of the room. For council members and anyone addressing the council, please remember to state your name clearly and please do not use the speakerphone feature as it will create feedback. Please mute your phones and if you do, or if you are joining us by phone and receive a phone call, please hang up from this call and dial back in after finishing your other call. For those signed onto the webinar, please do not broadcast your webcam. If you want to receive future email notifications of council meetings, project milestones, or rulemakings throughout our Click Dimensions program, you can do so by clicking on the link in the agenda or on the council webpage. Look for the green box on the right hand side of the page that says sign up for email updates. You may also sign up today on the computer near the entrance to the room. You are also welcome to access the online project mapping tool and any documents associated with tonight's hearing by visiting our website. These are also available on the computer near the entrance to the room. Please note that the audio and video of this meeting is being recorded and may be posted to the council website following the meeting. The Energy Facility Council meeting shall be conducted in a respectful and courteous manner where everyone is allowed to state their positions at the appropriate times consistent with council rules and procedures. Willful, accusatory, offensive, insulting, threatening, insolent, or slanderous comments which disrupt the council meeting are not acceptable. Pursuant to Oregon Administrative Rule 345-011-0080, any person who engages in unacceptable conduct which disrupts the meeting may be expelled. So we'll move on to approval of minutes. Um, any discussion of the minutes or are we read, can, does someone want to make a motion? It's Hanley. Yeah. Councilmember Jenkins, your mic is off. Get it closer. Oh, it's okay. on. Oh, you're right. Okay, we've had a motion and it's been seconded. Um, Mr. Secretary, could you please call the roll? Ken Howe? Yes. Hanley Jenkins? Cindy Condon? Yes. Marcy Grill? Yes. Jordan Truitt? Yes. Motion carries, Mr. Vice Chair. Okay, um, we're ready for the. Is there a council secretary report tonight? Yes, okay. Mr. Vice Chair, there is. Second. Okay, first I would like to provide a council member update. So um, I have an update on uh, Phil Stenbeck's replacement. Governor Brown has appointed uh, Ann Beyer. Uh, to replace Phil Stenbeck. Ann Beyer is the retired Crook County Planning Director. Um, she had also previously worked at the Department of Land Conservation and Development. Uh, on June 1st will be the Senate confirmation hearing. So that's the uh, uh, the Senate subcommittee that evaluates all board and commission members. So she will be uh, evaluated by the Senate uh, Rules Committee on June 1st. If appointed uh, on either June 2nd or 3rd, whenever the full Senate meets, then she would be available for the next council meeting, which will be the June 23rd and 24th. So um, Anne is actually on the line today. She was on at the last council meeting as well. Um, so I'd like to say hi and thanks for uh, jumping on and, and watching how things go. So keep our fingers crossed for the, uh, the Senate Rules Committee. Uh, next on my list uh, are project updates. 
<clears throat> so first I will start with the state line wind project. Um, on April 19th of this year, we received a request for amendment number seven of the project. So the project is an existing operational wind energy facility consisting of two geographic units, state line one and two and band sickle two. Uh, project is located in North Umatilla County. State line one and two is composed of 186 wind turbines, has a peak generating capacity of up to 123 megawatts. And sickle two consists of up to 45 wind turbines with a peak generating capacity of up to 119 megawatts. And uh, NextEra Energy Resources uh, is the parent company. Uh, amendment number seven is a request to amend the site certificate condition uh, related to uh, turbine dimensions for the Van Sickle two uh, wind turbines. Um, so if they are repowered and, and there was a uh, approval to repower the that portion of the project under amendment number six. So the dimensions uh, related to this amendment would include lowering the minimum above ground blade tip clearance from 59 feet to 50 feet. So as the blade sweeps down to the ground um, and increasing the hub height from 295 feet to 315 feet. So included in amendment number seven is a request for type B review. On May 2nd, I'm sorry, May 12th, the department determined that the amendment request was complete. On May 13th, the department determined the type B review was justified and issue its type B uh, review ADR determination, including a courtesy uh, email notice. Also on May 13th, the department issued the draft proposed order for the uh, amendment. The written comment period on the draft proposed order extends through June 6th. Uh, because this is a type B amendment review, there will not be a draft proposed order hearing and there is no opportunity for a contested case. So just a written comment time frame, which is currently going. And then council's review and possible final decision on the amendment uh, will likely be at the June council meeting and Chase McVeigh Walker is the project lead on the amendment. Are there any questions on this amendment before I move on? Okay, next is an update on a new project. Uh, we received uh, a notice of intent for the Echo Solar project on May 10th. Um, this is proposed as a 1,250 megawatt solar PV project uh, with 1,250 megawatts of distributed battery storage associated with it on 10,900 acres or 17 square miles. Project will be located in Morrill County, just southeast of the, bo uh, the Boardman bombing range. So, you know, we're, we're all pretty familiar with Boardman. If you know where Tower Road is, if you go down Tower Road several miles, past where the Boardman bombing range is, the project would start sort of at the very southeast corner of, of that location. Uh, the applicant is Echo Solar LLC, which is a subsidiary of Pine Gate Renewables LLC. Uh, since we've just received the notice of intent, we've not yet created a project page or sent a notice yet on this. So it is still really, really new. Uh, we'll be doing both of those shortly. Uh, we will also be holding a public uh, information meeting on the notice of intent. Uh, we're still figuring out the dates and the location of that, but those that will likely be uh, in July. So more to come on that. And Chris Clark is the project lead for that project. Any questions? Okay, next, um, we've given this update, uh, I think annually for a while. Um, so there are five wind facilities that have long-term wildlife reporting. So this is the annual update on those. Um, so these five facilities, which I'll list in a minute, in a minute implement the wildlife monitoring and mitigation plans, uh, which include a requirement to provide an opportunity for public comment and a review of ongoing wildlife reporting. These five projects consist of the Bigelow Canyon Wind Farm, the Klondike 3 Wind Project, the Leaning Juniper 2A Wind Power Facility, the Leaning Juniper 2B Wind Power Facility, and the State Line Wind Project. 2021 annual reports, which every uh, facility has to submit an annual report. The 2021 reports were received uh, by the department uh, in April of 2022, uh, which is consistent with the requirements. 
um, and it included uh, 2021 wildlife reports. These reports are available for public review and comment through July 30th, 2022. So that would be a 60 day comment period. They're available on the project pages and comments may be submitted to Kate Sloan, senior siting <clears throat> analyst uh, by email. So ongoing wildlife monitoring for these five facilities include long-term raptor nest surveys, Washington ground squirrel surveys, and incidental wildlife reporting. The long-term wildlife surveys are conducted every three to five years, depending on the facility. Long-term raptor nest surveys are on a five-year schedule, and long-term Washington ground squirrel surveys are on a three-year schedule. All five facilities are required to participate in the ongoing monitoring and reporting of fatalities under the Wildlife Incident Response and Handling System and report annually on those findings. Uh, brief update summaries are provided uh, with the details, and I'll get to those in a second. So for Bigelow Canyon and Klondike 3, reporting requirements were limited to incidental wildlife and reporting for state line. Uh, reporting requirements were limited to monitoring and artificial nest structures uh, or the use of those nest structures and incidental wildlife response. For leaning juniper 2A and 2B, reporting requirements include raptor nest surveys and nest success evaluation and incidental wildlife response. The leaning juniper 2A and B information, um, we did not receive all of the information, so we're still waiting to receive more uh, information related to that. So we are reaching out to the site certificate holder to get more information related to that, uh, those two facilities. So specifically for Bigelow Canyon, um, the Wildlife Incident Response and Handling System, uh, there was a report of six avian fatalities, um, including one bald eagle. This facility maintains an incidental take permit with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, and is implemented, implementing additional fatality monitoring studies and mitigation associated with that permit. The Klondike 3 wind project uh, in 2021 operations personnel recorded one common raven fatality. And then for state line in 2021, that was the last annual monitoring year for the five year artificial nest structures uh, installed as habitat enhancement measures. All five artificial nest structures were monitored for maintenance needs in February of 2021. None of the artificial nest structures needed to be refreshed or repaired. Um, there was no activity or observable use of the five artificial structures, however. Uh, monitoring frequency will now be every five years, and the next one will occur in 2026. Also associated with the state line project, uh, the certificate holder reported one carcass observed within the facility site, um, which was an American white pelican. So that concludes my updates on the projects and those monitoring requirements. Are there any questions? Okay, last thing on my list is the next council meeting, which is June 23rd and 24th. Uh, we will be having rulemaking hearings the evening of the 23rd, Thursday, uh, and then the regular council meeting on the 24th. Currently, we are planning for the meeting to be in Salem. Um, and so if anybody uh, would like to travel, please, we will be reaching out to you so we can make uh, appropriate reservations for you. Um, otherwise, you know, we will be holding similarly a hybrid meeting. So those who want to come in and attend in person, um, that would be great. But those who would rather attend uh, remotely, that will be that option as well. Todd? Yes. Ms. Hanley, um, which rules? Um, well, that kind of depends on tonight. Could be the protected area rules, could be the wildfire um, rules. I think those were the two. We also have the um, carbon rules, So, but I might be getting confused. Chris will be able to provide clarification. Um, I know one of them will actually be in July. I think that's the carbon rules. Um, or no, maybe it's, sorry. I think it's the wildfire and the carbon rules would be in June. And because, you know, if you decide tomorrow to move forward with the notice of proposed rulemaking for the protected areas, I believe that one would be in July. So Thank if you. I'm wrong, Chris will correct me. Thank you. <laughs> but it is some combination of those three on those two different dates. Okay, with that, I will conclude my 
Secretary report. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. <clears throat> the next item is the Nolan Hill Hills Wind Power Project, the public hearing on the draft proposed order on application for the site certificate. Um, the uh, Nolan Hills is a 600 megawatt wind and solar facility in Umatilla County. It's proposed by Nolan Hills Wind LLC. We have um, for an overview of the proposed facility, uh, Kathleen Sloan, a senior siting an analyst that will provide the overview of the siting process, the proposed facility components, components and location. Um, there will be a public hearing overview by Kate Triana, the senior administrative law judge at the Oregon Office of Administrative Hearings that will explain the legal requirements for providing comments on the record and will facilitate the hearing. Then we'll have the public hearing where interested individuals will have an opportunity to provide oral testimony on the ASC and the draft proposed order. Written comments may also be submitted to the department through the close of the public hearing. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Sloan. Thank you, Vice Chair Howe. For the record, this is Kathleen Sloan. I'm gonna go by Kathleen this evening because our administrative law judge is also goes by Kate and I don't want people to get confused. <laughs> but thank you for being here and being here for the meeting. I'm gonna go over a few slides about our process, um, where we are in our process and a little overview of the project, and then I am going to turn it over to the ALJ and she will open and run the hearing. So, so to start, I'm just gonna go over a few overview slides. So tonight we are presenting um, on the draft proposed order for the Nolan Hills Wind Power Project. So I'm gonna go over the proposed facility the public hearing process, and then, like I said, the ALJ will go into the hearing. She will open and run the hearing. So can I have the next slide, please? So the FSEC is short for the Energy Facility Siting Council, and this is part of the review process of FSEC. Um, we have a consolidated review process um, and FSEC, the council has oversight over most large scale energy facilities and infrastructure within Oregon. We have seven members of the council, their governor appointed and confirmed by the state Senate. And they are volunteers and they are from various parts of the state and bring a whole breadth of experience to our council for these decisions. And Odo's which is short for the Oregon Department of Energy, Siting Division is the staff for FSEC. And so we have some staff here. I am one of them. I'm a senior siting analyst. I also have uh, Sarah Esterson, who is our policy analyst. Todd Cornett is our council secretary. He's also our program manager and administrator. Behind me is Wally Adams. He is also one of our policy analysts, I believe. And, um, Nancy Hatch, who is helping as an administrative assistant in our department, and she is helping facilitate this meeting. Next slide. So very briefly, I just wanted to give you an overview, kind of a schematic of bo both our process and where we are at in our process. So in the beginning, uh, the applicant files a notice of intent that notice of intent is open for public comment and it initiates the agency coordination that we do. And it's basically the initial plan or proposal for the project. The next step is the project order. The department, ODO, will issue a project order and the project order will review the notice of intent and the project information and basically set the framework of what the review and the analysis needs to be within the draft proposed order um, for the project. And after that point, um, it sets the parameters for the analysis within the project boundary and the things that, that the applicant needs to prepare and submit um, as part of the pre-application and the application. So the pre-application, the preliminary application for site certificate gets filed and there is a entire process that goes between the applicant and our department from the PASC to the ASC. 
And that is where, where there's a lot of requests for additional information. We review and analyze the information in the studies that's provided. We take the reviewing agency coordination information. And what comes out of that is a revised preliminary and then a final application. And the application for site certificate is not the final application until the department deems it complete. So once it's deemed complete, then we do another initiated round of agency coordination and start the drafting of the proposed order, the draft proposed order. And once the draft proposed order is, is written, we issue it and it's open for public comment. And so we have issued the draft proposed order. We issued it on April 19th. It was posted on our website. It went out in publication as a public notice. We have emails that go out and whole distribution list of how, how people get notified and notified that the draft proposed order is out. It's available for review. It's posted on our web page and our website so people can go and review it and review any sections or any exhibits, any parts of the application that were used. Um, and then once that is done and we are drafting the proposed order um, and it's drafted and we've published it, then we have a comment period. And that comment period is opened at the initiate when it goes public and it's issued. And then it will run through the public hearing. And typically it closes at the end of the public hearing. And so tonight is where we're at in the process. So we are at the public hearing on the draft proposed order. And so this is an opportunity for those who are interested who may not have submitted written comments or comments through our comment portal to make public comment. Um, it's also an opportunity for the applicant to be here and they're here and I'm going to introduce them really quickly. So our applicant is Nolan Hills LLC represented and a whole subsidiary of Capital Power. I believe I got that right. So Matt Martin is the lead person for Capital Power and he is here with two of his team Linnea Fossum, who is with Tetra Tech, who helped do the lead on all of the environmental review and the application parts that they submitted. And then Tim McMahon, who is also here as, I believe, your legal support or legal counsel. Okay. So, yes. Of me. Turning around. Okay. Is it going in and out? Okay. Okay, good, because I can't really hear how I sound when I'm talking into the microphone. Um, so anyways, that is where we are tonight. Once the draft proposed order and the public hearing are closed, then the department will move into the proposed order, and that is basically taking the input, any changes that may come out of tonight or public comment, and finalize the draft proposed order into a proposed order. Um, there is a process that we have called in a contested case, and that is also going to have an ALJ assigned to them if it, if it happens. But it is um, part of the public comment importance is that in order to be a member of the, or a participant in a contested case, you have to have your comments on the record. And then the final order and site certificate are the last steps. The final order is issued and the site certificate is issued, and, and that comes after council is finished. So next slide. So a little project overview. I know Capital Power will give a little bit more information in their section, but for Nolan Hills Wind, um, as I noted, Nolan Hills is an LLC, and they're a subsidiary of Capital Power corporation. Um, the proposed facility is in northwestern Umatilla County, and it is a proposed 600 megawatt wind and solar facility. The site boundary, which is what you see with the, the black line surrounding, is approximately 48,196 acres, and the related um, supporting facilities for the facility will be um, dispersed and centralized the battery energy storage system, um, which we call a BES. And there are two proposed uh, 
transmission lines, the 230 kV Gentile lines. And those are the, the lines extending out of the site boundary. Next slide. So, again, this is another kind of overview of where we're at. This is our procedural history. So, as I mentioned before, the applicant filed a notice of intent. They did this back in 2017. Then the preliminary came in and originally it was only for wind and that was filed in February of 2020. And through that iterative process that I explained of request for additional information that they respond to and revise preliminary application. They also expanded the project design to add um, solar PV to the wind. So now it's a wind and solar project. And by the time the application for site certificate, they also included um, the bus and the transmission line. So the whole project became what we reviewed in the final application for site certificate, which we deemed complete on January 31st of this year, 2022. And as I noted before, the department issued the draft proposal order on April 19th, and we are now in the, the red, the red highlighted area of our public hearing. Um, and the next steps will be uh, tomorrow. If it moves forward tomorrow, we will review with council as an information um, item on your agenda for for more comments and questions and then the next uh, phase would be the proposed order the notice of contested case and then a final decision next slide so to to emphasize the public participation phase at the dpo level part of the process um as i noted before once we issued the dpo it it is started the public comment process so we've been receiving comments um, since that date, and it's open um, to the public to participate in various ways. So some comments can be, you know, you can mail your comment, you can email your comment. We have a new public comment portal that is on our Odo webpage that you can enter your comment online and then it instantly becomes part of the official record. Um, and it's publicly available for, for other people to see it. You can fax it to us. You can have it FedEx to us. There's a lot of different ways. And tonight, the public hearing is just to provide people with the opportunity to be here in person and provide oral testimony or oral comment. And also for the ALJ to, to hold the public hearing. Next slide. So we have people calling in, people that may be online through our WebEx, um, as well as in the room. And we will go through uh, a process for calling on everybody that we will explain in a minute. So I just wanted to give some um, kind of framework for, for making a comment um, and, and what it means to be as part of the contested case. So. In order to be a participant in a contested case, you need to get your comments on the record and you can do that during the public comment period. Once the public comment period closes, we don't accept any more input that would relate to being in a contested case. For consideration in a contested case, um, precedent has showed us that issues need to be raised sufficient with sufficient specificity so that counsel and the department and the applicant can understand the issue and are afforded the opportunity to respond and there will be a, a point in the in the hearing where the applicant will be able to do that tonight um, and to raise an issue with sufficient specificity this the person making the comment needs to present facts to support their position Next slide. So this slide is basically to kind of give you a guidance if you're interested in making a comment of how to make an effective comment to the record and what is probably less effective. Um, so making sure that you're tying your comments specifically to our citing standards, which is what we're following in our process, and to the Oregon administration administrative rule, the OARs, and um, our standards. So being specific about whether or not you think a standard has been met and why is basically what 
what is an effective comment. You, if you can state supporting facts, um, submit al alternative or informational material that you think supports those facts. And then it's particularly helpful for us if you can reference the specific pages if you are taking issue with something specifically in the draft proposed order or the application itself. Um, less effective is basically stating your position without providing any supporting information as to why you, you are taking that position um, or maybe submitting information without making us aware of what it's referencing or what it's being supporting of. I think those are, and raising issues that are clearly outside of our jurisdiction or our process or making what are basically unsubstantiated comments, which is to fail to provide any backup support or documentation for what you're saying. So that, and that is just a guidance on how to participate and make effective comment. Next slide. So at this point, I am going to turn it over to our administrative law judge, who is Kate Triana, and she is with the um, Office of Administrative Hearings in Oregon, and she is our Council appointed hearing officer. So at this juncture, I am going to quit talking and I'm going to turn it over to the ALJ. So, Kate, um, I am turning it over to you. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Kathleen. Uh, so, as uh, we've mentioned, this is the public hearing on the uh, draft proposed order on the application for a site certificate. Uh, for the Nolan Hills Wind Power Project, and I am Kate Triana. Uh, I'm a senior administrative law judge at the Oregon Office of Administrative Hearings, uh, and I've been appointed as the FSEC appointed hearing officer in this matter. Uh, we're sometimes referred to as hearing officers, sometimes ALJs um, or administrative law judges. Um, and so I'm serving as the presiding officer for <clears throat> this hearing today. Uh, it is May 26, 2022. The time is currently 5.56 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. And just to get on the record, uh, this public hearing is being held at the Energy Fil Facility Siting Council or FSEC meeting. Uh, it's in person at the Red Lion Hotel located in Pendleton, Oregon, uh, but it is a hybrid hearing. So it's also being held via um, WebEx webinar uh, with a call-in option for those who can't participate in person or via WebEx. So the purpose of the public hearing um, is to provide an opportunity for the public reviewing agencies and the applicant uh, to present oral and written testimony on the Nolan Hills Wind Power Project application for site for certificate and draft proposed order. Uh, the 37 day record of the public hearing comment period on this draft proposed order is scheduled to close um, today at the conclusion of this hearing, uh, unless we discuss otherwise during the hearing. Um, so at the conclusion of uh, my brief presentation today, uh, we're going to call on each person interested in providing oral testimony. Um, and I say we because Kathleen's going to help me with um, calling on the people who are in person. Um, and so we're going to start, though, with um, some oral testimony or presentation by the applicant. Uh, I understand they also have a, a PowerPoint they're going to present at that point. Uh, then we'll take public comments from people who are in person um, at the um, hearing there in Pendleton. Uh, then we'll take anyone who's on the WebEx webinar, and then finally we will follow up with phone participants. Um, <clears throat> so just looking over, it looks like Kathleen had told me there are about five people um, at the meeting who want to testify or provide comments, seven. Okay, and it looks like we have a number of people on the phone. I don't know if everybody on the phone is planning to testify or provide comments, but I think based on the, the number of people, I am going to set a time limit for comments today. Um, I'm going to set a five minute per comment time limit. Um, and so then each individual will be allotted five minutes. Uh, department staff are going to track the time for each commenter. Um, and I think you'll be able to view it on the WebEx also to see how much time you had. 
or have and how much time is remaining. Um, if your time ends and you're still speaking, I'm going to kind of jump in and try and uh, have you wrap it up just so that we can transition to the next speaker. I want to make sure we get through all the comments uh, today. So please try and be respectful of the allotted time and any other speakers today. If I have to ask any clarifying questions, or if a council member asks a clarifying question of the commenters, um, the time will be stopped for the question and response period, uh, and then restarted to allow the commenter to have the full time allotment. <clears throat> and I think this has already been mentioned, but just so everyone's aware, this is being recorded. Uh, the presentations, the written comments, and the oral testimony will all become part of the decision record uh, for the proposed facility. If we could um, pull up on the hearing, on the PowerPoint, I believe there's a slide that corresponds to this. Um, Did we get the PowerPoint pulled back up? If we can't, it's okay. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, good. Okay. So pursuant to OAR 345-015-0220, subsection 5A and B, um, everyone needs to note the following. A person who intends to raise any issue that may be the basis for a contested case must raise the issue in person at the hearing or in a written comment submitted to the Department of Energy before the deadline stated in the notice of the public hearing. A person who intends to a person who intends to raise any issue that may be the basis for a contested case must raise the issue with sufficient specificity to afford the council, the Department of Energy, and the applicant an adequate opportunity to respond including a statement of facts that support the person's position on the issue. Um, and so when, when I say in person, that includes anybody um, participating in WebEx or by phone. Um, all right, so if we could move to the next slide, please. So to raise an issue in a contested case proceeding, the issue must be uh, first within the jurisdiction of the council. Uh, it needs to be raised in writing or in person prior to the close of the record of the public comment period, which uh, unless discussed otherwise will be at the close of this hearing today, May 22nd, 2022. And it must be raised with su sufficient specificity to afford the council, the Department of Energy and the applicant an adequate opportunity to respond um, and to raise an issue with sufficient specificity, a person must present facts that, the, that support the person's position on the issue. Um, okay. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, so we'll probably put this back up during um, the comment period after the applicant does their um, presentation, but just so everyone's aware, prior to testifying today or making your comment, I, uh, we need everyone to state the following, your full name uh, with the spelling of your name. If you're with some sort of organization or group that you're representing, uh, please say the name of the organization or group. Uh, if you are also representing an organization or, organization or group, please let us know your title with that group. Uh, and then finally, a physical mailing or email address where the department can send uh, notice information to you. Uh, and as you can see on that slide, if you don't want to provide uh, your mailing or email address publicly, uh, you can email it to Kathleen, her emails up there as well as a phone number, uh, but you do need to provide that. Uh, if we don't, if the, the department doesn't get that, they can't provide you then with any notice that you're allowed. Um, okay, so I think at this point, the applicant had um, a short presentation they wanted to do. Uh, so Kathleen, is this the point we wanted to do it?
Sorry, my mic was not on. That's okay. All right. So, yes, at this point. It is capital power. Great. Great. Thank you. Test, test. I think can you hear me? Great. Great. Thank you. Council members, um, hearing officer Triana. Odo staff, thank you for having us here tonight. My name is Matt Martin with Capital Power on behalf of the applicant, Nolan Hills Wind LLC. I'm our director of business development. Been working on this project for, for some time as we went over some of the dates earlier. I'm pleased to present you a little bit more information about the project tonight and give you some background on the applicant, uh, Capital Power in, in particular. We'll go through a few slides. I'll try to keep it quick so we can open it up for public comment. So if we could get to the next slide. Okay, we, yeah, we're having a, a technical issue. We need to, to update the correct slide deck. Okay. Oh, stay tuned. It'll only take a minute. Oh, no, no problem. Great, thank you. So, as I, I mentioned, um, Matt Martin, Director of Business Development for Capital Power. So, Capital Power is a uh, Canadian-based independent power producer. We are we own uh, 27 different facilities across the U.S. and Canada, um, more than 6,600 megawatts that we we operate across a variety of different technologies. So, we own uh, coal, natural gas as well as um, a, a large portfolio of wind and solar projects across the US and Canada. We've got over 800 employees um, and we are an investment grade uh, rated um, company by S&P, as well as a publicly traded company up on the Toronto Stock Exchange. So I think um, you know, the, the key takeaway that I wanted to provide for you on this slide is that we do have the financial wherewithal to build this project. We, we do own and operate our projects long-term 
and um, you know we have a, a fairly large market cap. We're we're on par in terms of size with Portland General Electric. So while this will be our first project within Oregon, you know we do have a fairly substantial balance sheet and are able to to build this project ourselves. So next slide, please. So this slide didn't come out all too well since you can't see the um, background, but if you can imagine some of those dots are all of our different facilities across North America and there's a big cluster north of the border in Canada. But I think that the takeaway here is that we've got facilities all over the country, both the US and Canada. Um, and the different colors are, are the different technologies, wind and solar. So next slide, please. So this is a picture of the Nolan Hills site, which we have been working on, and the project's been in development for a long, long time. I think the first wind lease for this project was signed in 2010. The first meteorological towers went up in 2011. Um, we've owned the project since 2014 and been working on it for the last eight years. So while the NOI went in about five years ago, the development on the site has been going on for a long, long time. Um, it was originally just a wind project. We've since expanded it to be a wind and solar project. And so it's up to 600 megawatts with a variety of, of um, it, up to 340 megawatts of wind, um, the 260 megawatts listed here of solar, as well as a battery energy storage project that would be co-located with the storage. So um, the project's about four miles south of Echo, as the crow flies 10 miles west of Pendleton, as we found out today, it takes about 45 minutes to get there, but it's, um, it's, it's, it's very isolated south of the river. And um, I think we mentioned earlier over 48,000 acres of land as part of the project. So we've been studying it a long, long time. We feel like we, we have a good feel for the site and have uh, cited everything appropriately. Next slide. Here's a, here's a picture of the site. Um, Again, very small, hard to see, but the yellow dots are the 112 proposed wind turbine locations. Uh, the yellow shaded area is the nearly 1900 acres of uh, where the solar facility will be. There's a deep purple line that goes through the middle of the site. That's actually a um, an overhead 230 kilovolt line that will connect our southern array of turbines to our northern array of turbines. And so there's two uh, blue boxes on there. So there's two project substations. Um, it, I believe it's about a seven mile line that connects the two. And from there, um, most of the turbines will be connected via underground collector cables and they will all uh, funnel into that substation uh, to the south or to the north, depending upon which array it's at. It's very hard to see in the light here, but there's a pretty large swath of empty area in the middle of the site around Alkali Canyon. So through a number of our avian studies, as well as our Washington ground squirrel studies, we found um, you know, a very nice wildlife setting down there. So we've set back our turbines and facilities uh, from, from Alkali Canyon. I believe there's another slide later on where we'll talk about the transmission lines. So just real quick, we mentioned a lot of this already up to 112 turbines. The the tip height of the turbines is, is under 500 feet. And so that's kind of a rare in wind technology these days. A lot of turbines are going bigger. This project is going to be capped at 500 feet due to some radar concerns. So we've signed commitments to, to stay below 500 feet. Right now, everything is based on a three megawatt turbine. And, um, at the end of the day, that the turbine technology changes over time, and and you know we will be selecting it based on an optimal fit at a uh, later date as we approach construction. Next slide. So the solar component I mentioned earlier, it's a lot of numbers. I think the key is it's up to 1,900 acres. Um, it will be a tracking system, which isn't listed here, so it will be in north south facing arrays and it'll track from east to west over the course of the day. And it will be directly connected to the battery energy storage project such that it is, uh, the battery itself will be charged by the solar facility. This is a picture of one of our operating facilities in North Carolina. Next slide. Here's a picture of the best. Not a lot of uh, detail needed. It looks like a big C can or box where the battery modules are are inside. Uh, everything is self-contained and uh, will be constructed in, in a large array on the site at that northern substation. Next slide. It, this is a uh, a picture of a facility kind of towards the end of operation. Um, 
wind farm in, in Illinois provides a little context in terms of, um, you know, we, we permit or, or we apply for kind of the largest footprint. You'll see about it. That's a 10 acre site where our O&M building and substation are. Substations on the bottom of the slide, the operations buildings on the kind of upper left with the turbines in the background. And you can kind of see how when a project is temporarily disturbed versus when it, it ultimately, you know, everything gets restored. So you can see kind of the, the dark soil that's been kind of tilled back up and ultimately replanted. But these are just a lot of stats in terms of what else is included in the application. We can go to the next slide. On the transmission side, um, Kathleen mentioned earlier, but there are two different options. Uh, one is a 25 mile line that for the most part follows an existing Umatilla Electric co-op uh, right of way. And so the, the plan there, and, and there's a picture of a, of a large high voltage line on the screen, but the plan there would be to take the existing Umatilla Electric co-op lines, which are generally distribution lines, and replace the existing poles. So you'd be staying on the same side of the road as the existing poles. You'd put those distribution lines back kind of halfway up the pole. And then our higher voltage lines would be at the top of the pole. And so you, there's uh, some good examples of this throughout uh, UEC's territory. It's been done for other projects. The other option is a uh, 230 kV line connected to the Bonneville Power Administration uh, Stanfield substation, which is a planned substation or proposed substation. At the end of the day, uh, there there is a power line that goes through the site today. That's 230 kV. It's um, the Lagrand to McNary 230 kV line. Unfortunately, that line is uh, almost completely full, and so we can't connect to those existing lines. A new line is going to be constructed, and so we've been having this project studied by BPA. Similar to the NOI, we first went back in, in in 2017 as a wind project. We subsequently expanded it to the 600 megawatts and you and BPA has been studying it for the last five years. We expect results in July. The plan would be to build a, uh, a new substation um, at a to be determined location at 230 kV and then Bonneville would have to separately permit a new line from that substation all the way to McNary at 500 kV. And so that would be a separate permitting process that BPA would run. Next slide, I think it's a, next slide is a map of the two different options. So lots of colors and dotted lines here, but the, the upper left-hand corner, the, call it the Northwest part of the site is that 25 mile zigzagging line. The reason it zigzags is that's the way the existing UEC poles go. And then there's a little nub on the top, almost in the exact center of the site that is kind of uh, our line to connect to the proposed uh, BPA Stanfield site. And so we have applied for a line that crosses over the Umatilla River and um, where BPA will effectively take ownership at a new substation and, and go continue to go north with their own line, which would extend past the purple area. Next slide. So this is just a you know some of the um, local benefits of the project. We do anticipate entering into a, uh, a SIP agreement with the county. A lot of information in terms of like full-time jobs. Um, this will be a very large construction project and there will be a lot of activity on the site. Um, when it is operating, uh, typically we have a, uh, you know, one wind technician for every 10 turbines is kind of the general rule of thumb. So the number of full-time employees will depend upon how many turbines we build. Uh, we do expect kind of the, our, our wind staff to also monitor and, and maintain the, the the solar facility, and and we will rely upon a lot of third party O and M um, vendors for um, services and support over the course of the thirty to hopefully longer life lifespan. And um, you know we like to kind of highlight that Capital Power does work a lot with with local organizations and we do have a um a reputation for for you know giving back in the communities that we do operate in here's a picture of a, a fire station and in, in, near one of our wind farms in texas and and we do like to give back to those communities that we become a part of next slide this is a, a quick summary of all the engagement we've been doing over the course of the last five years um, it's all in the application if you want to go into more detail.
and we'll just go to the next slide. And again, all, all the surveys that have been taking place, you'll see some of these go back as far as 2010 in terms of the avian surveys, as well as the raptor surveys. So I believe that's it. So I will, um, if you want to skip to the next slide, I will turn things back over to the hearing officer and happy to field any questions. All right, thank you. Um, I don't have any questions. Any questions from council? Hey, Kate, this is Todd Cornett for the record. Um, can I add something really quick? Yes. I'm going to take that as a yes. So I just want to disclose on the record, I think it got missed in one of the slides um, between the two slide decks. So just to, to put it on the public record, um, Council Members Condon and Jenkins uh, were on a site visit with staff at the Nolan Hills site today. So I just want to make sure that that was uh, fully disclosed. Um, just in case anybody had any concerns or wanted to raise any concerns about that. So with that, I will end with Matt. Excuse me. Yes. Okay. Was okay. there someone else who had something they wanted to say? No. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Martin. All right. I think we're ready to move on to the public comment portion. Is that correct? Sorry, Kate, I think we still have uh, part of the capital power team wanting to provide some comment. That's correct. Um, Your Honor, this is Tim McMahon with Stoll Ridge Law Firm, and I here, am here on behalf of the applicant. We also have with us um, a land, one of the landowners as a representative who is testifying on behalf of the applicant. So I'll hand forward um, his card, but understand that uh, Mr. Corey um, will be here speaking next. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, my name is Steve Corey. Uh, my full name is Stephen H. Period or Hoke Corey. Uh, I live here in Pendleton, uh, and uh, I am uh, one of the family owners of the properties that principally are involved in this project. And those those companies are uh, Cunningham Sheep Company, Pendleton Ranches, and Mud Springs Ranches. And I serve as uh, one of the shareholders and as chairman of their boards. Uh, and so I speak on their behalf and in favor of this project. Uh, I wanted to tell you, and I appreciate the time, and I'll do it as quickly as I can, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about our ranching and farming and uh, how we operate and how this project will affect us and what we as uh, landowners foresee with respect to it. Uh, and I have uh, submitted as part of the packet a letter and uh, want to make sure that some points in the letter are at least uh, addressed and then will be available to answer questions if you have questions. So I appreciate that opportunity. Um, we farm uh, and uh, and ranch, uh, 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 a larger ranch than 75,000 acres. I'm not sure that I haven't gone back to look at it. This involves a project you've seen the size of about 43,000 acres where it's proposed. Uh, we have a, an integrated farm and ranch. Uh, we raise cattle, we raise sheep, uh, we raise uh, timber, uh, and we do dry land wheat farming, and we have participations for stewardship in our lands in conservation reserve programs and other federal programs that are available and uh, of assistance to all the farmers and ranchers. Uh, and uh, uh, so um, I wanted to just speak for a few minutes about different aspects of this project and how it involves us. Um, first, uh, uh, I wanted to address the uh, uh, solar facilities. The solar facilities are proposed on 1,800 acres, slightly more than that, of our property. Uh, and uh, uh, I wanted to tell you with respect to that, that we view that, uh, uh, that as something complementary and supportive of our overall agricultural uh, ranching opportunities and things that we do. Uh, we, uh, we think that uh, in terms of uh, of how it is situated, that it's situated so that uh, we can utilize all of the land around it and participate uh, in our ways with uh, uh, with uh, agricultural continuing operations with all the lands around it. Uh, and uh, 
we intend uh, to continue and intensify our agricultural practices as a result of participations. Uh, when we have uh, lease payments coming in, we've got uh, uh, many things that we can enhance with our ranch that we have not ultimately uh, over time been able to do. My grandparents actually came here in uh, the 19 teens. Uh, both of them are Oklahoma State graduates. Uh, both of them moved here to Oregon and settled here and uh, uh, and uh, became ranchers uh, soon after they arrived. And this is a ranch that continues now. And we actually have, uh, 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 I would say, uh, I haven't counted, but uh, 35 or 40 participants in three different generations that are owners and users and, uh, and uh, consultants and so on with this ranch. My brother was here, he just went to a little league game, but he's a, a veterinarian and uh, he uh, provides uh, veterinary assistance to our sheep and our cattle and our horses. And uh, uh, I could really go through a long family list of family members that all have roles and participations uh, in this particular ranch. Um, we, uh, I, I wanna just go through a little bit of the letter without uh, being too redundant. Uh, we don't think the project negatively will impact our access to irrigation or water rights. This land is not located uh, within an irrigation district and we're unaware of any certificated water rights associated with the land inside the project boundary or land designated for solar facilities. There are no wells or ponds on the land designated for solar facilities and we have no intention or need to apply for any water rights in this area at this time or in the foreseeable future. Now that's important to us and I know important to the project. In fact, uh, the project, as I say, will enable us to support and improve our farming and ranching operations in the surrounding area by providing uh, payments that we can invest in ongoing activities on a more active basis elsewhere on our property. Uh, specifically, we intend to devote part of the lease revenues to improving, improving housing for our sheep herders. Uh, as well as farm employees that are in the cattle and farming departments. Uh, we have, uh, 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 if you looked at a deferred maintenance uh, and uh, forced a deferred maintenance because ranching and farming is not exactly super profitable in the type that we have, uh, this will actually provide, we think, a big help to our cattle and our sheep operations and our farming operations for our employees. Um, we also uh, will have been looking at and we'll look at uh, different ways that we can uh, clean up and expand uh, our contiguous related egg uh, businesses uh, in order to strengthen sort of the base. One of the things we've looked at is different uh, uh, recreational and, and hunting programs that would be incorporated in that we could continue to utilize in connection with the land. Um, and like most farmers, we've got lots of needs for repairs of uh, other buildings and uh, uh, and intend to use payments for that purpose as well. Um, for us, the project will not, as we project, result in any reduction in the amount of uh, employees that we have. Uh, to the contrary, we actually expect we will add agricultural jobs uh, in one fashion or another because of the different things we'll now be able to do that will support and continue our agricultural venture. Um, we also expect to maintain and increase uh, operational spending with local uh, producers, with local business peoples, uh, uh, grain uh, companies, with uh, fertilizer companies, with uh, others that are not uh, uh, in our ownership but are around this community. It will actually provide more money for us to do things that uh, I'm not sure with the price of uh, fertilizer and diesel today from what's happened in the world in the last six weeks, uh, we'll be able to keep up with that either, but that will for certain put us in the ballpark to stay going. So we, uh, uh, so we appreciate that. Uh, so uh, uh, in short, I'm gonna quit with that, but I just wanted to give you an overview of our ranch and we'll be around if people have questions to ask about it. And uh, it certainly is a project that we too, uh, like uh, Capital Power have worked on for uh, uh, 10 to 15 years in order to get to this point. And so it's an important project also for us. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Corey. Just for the record, could you spell your last name? Yes, I'm, I can. Uh, C-O-R-E-Y, Corey. Thank you. Uh, does anyone with council have any questions for Mr. Corey? Okay, I'm not hearing any. Thank you, Mr. Corey. Thank you. 
see, Mr. McMahon, were you gonna, was he gonna make a statement as well? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, <clears throat> Tim McMahon here. Um, and uh, I will try to keep my comments pretty short. I submitted a letter to the council uh, earlier this week, I think, along with um, an attachment. And so what I don't plan to do is to go through that letter, um, although I'm happy to answer questions now or later about the letter that we've submitted. Um, and uh, but there are some, some um, key reasons that we want to just make clear uh, and understand from the council standpoint, you know, sort of how, how the stand, how the council's view of implementing goal three exceptions may or may not be evolving because we have some concerns about some precedential issues and how applicants can kind of replicate a successful opportunity to make a, make our way through the pro processes. So that's really what I want to focus on here. And again, I'll try to keep this in a five minute ish range, but um, this is what happened to my notepad when I sat there listening to everybody. So I'll try to, <laughs> try to keep on point. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> this has been a long project, uh, long duration, and I've been involved with this project from its outset. And it has been a thrill for me to watch this project evolve and change and become what I think is truly one of the great um, renewable energy projects for the Northwest, given the kind of hybridization of the technologies that this project can deploy and the ability to essentially deliver baseload power with clean energy. It's a pretty awesome project and one that I'm very proud to stand with. Um, uh, we firmly believe that the evidentiary standards satisfy the goal three exception here. We worked quite a bit with Mr. Corey and Bob Levy as well on um, on having them help us to 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 not only make the case but to prove that this project delivers more than just an income stream to a landowner. So this project really, I think, is a fairly a, quite an exceptional project. Um, we, I have been at several council meetings. I have heard Mr. Jenkins and um, Mr. Howe uh, talk about the need for applicants to do a better job with goal three exceptions. We listened to that um, and we uh, understand it and we have worked very hard with Odo, with the landowners, with our consulting team, with Linnea Fossum's team at Tetra Tech to do the very best job we can to articulate how this project does stand out and does meet and succeed um, for goal three exceptions. But here's the things, here are some things that I am just a bit concerned about. Um, uh, the issue of goal three exceptions, there's a history and discussion with sort of some loose use of the term uniqueness and I'm guilty of loosely using that term myself. In fact, in the letter, I accidentally used it again. Um, but but I do I do think it's important to ask ourselves and for the council to consider what that means. Does uniqueness only happen once? <laughs> if it's unique, does it only happen once? And if so, what does that do to the ability to rely on precedent with future projects that are attempting to satisfy the goal three standards through exceptions or other standards for that matter. So I think that's something that we just wish uh, the council to really consider here. Uh, what will the next facility be able to rely on for precedent? And I'm assuming this project will be successfully permitting, permit, permitted. I believe we'll get our goal three exception because I think we've done an awesome job, but I am just concerned and wondering about future applications. So there is a difference, I think, with how the English language uses this word uniqueness, and sorry to get wonky on you here, and I looked into uh, the or originization of this language and how it, has evolved, how it evolved in the 16th century, and it has evolved since the 16th century. Um, Todd Cornett is a unique human being. Sarah Esterson has the unique ability to, to, to spot flaws in Todd's arguments. <laughs> so there's only one Todd, but Sarah's ability to spot flaws in Todd's arguments is probably shared by others. So there is a difference in just calling something unique and saying uniqueness happens only once and then talking more broadly about the unique ability of a project to proceed and to, uh, to deliver value um, to the community and to satisfy climate change goals and objectives. So here's the deal. <clears throat> in our view, the Nolan Hills project has the unique ability to deploy hybrid clean energy generation resources on a large site that enables the best locations for a solar facility and a wind facility and a battery energy storage facility to also enhance agricultural practices and to meet the state's and the region's climate goals. 
So that's my elevator pitch on how I think that uniqueness in this setting should be judged and considered. You've heard from Mr. Corey, um, this is a legacy multi-generation agricultural oper operation where site selection for each component can minimize and avoid high value farmland areas. The project has selected flat locations with no irrigation rights for its solar facility. That was deliberate and we were able to use a large site to do that. We were able to choose the best locations for the wind energy generation that uh, minimizes impacts to natural resources. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what is important about this site is in fact its unique ability to develop a significant renewable energy project while enabling substantial investments in long-standing, sustainable, and enhanced agricultural practices. This project adds a lot of jobs, new housing, and will provide significant tax revenues for this county and the region. And it is based upon uh, those attributes that the DPO does recommend, um, thank you very much, John, uh, does recommend granting the goal three exception. <clears throat> and I'll do this. So, um, and we're also, also enabling the project to make um, some fairly significant investments in climate mitigation. <clears throat> So we ask the council to just take care in how you're making goal three exception findings so that they aren't so onerous that there potentially um, could be some compromise in the ability to build additional clean energy projects in the future. That's why I wanted to make sure that we had this opportunity to make this presentation and discuss this issue. I'm happy to answer questions later on. I'm sure Mr. Jenkins will love to take some shots at me on land use issues. That's, of course, par for the course. Um, so I very much appreciate the ability to speak here this evening. Thank you. Here now. <laughs> I know you want to do this, Hanley. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMahon. Um, is there anyone else from the applicant that was going to provide any information today? One more. Sorry, Matt Martin again with, with Capital Power. And so we did submit a, a, a comment letter and I just wanted to reiterate for the record, I won't go through Mr. McMahon's arguments about goal three. Um, the one thing I did wanna kind of highlight with everyone is our comments on the decommissioning funding that that's required of the project. And we outlined some of the arguments and, and we've had kind of a back and forth is over the last couple of years, um, you know, no objections to taking down the project in 30 to 35 years. It's just the amount that is currently estimated, um, which was done by Tetra Tech in terms of a decommissioning estimate. And, you know, we believe there's a certain amount of contingency that should be added for uh, Odo staff to oversee decommissioning when it comes time. And, and that's included in our, our estimate when, um, you know, as part of the back and forth and part of the review, there was an additional 10% added, but, um, on behalf of uh, Odo, which you know, capital powers contingencies in this, I think six hundred thousand dollar range. Uh, Odo's contingency adds an additional over three million dollars um, to to that, and then the BES itself has a twenty percent contingency. And and again, contingency is designed because we don't know what's going to happen into the future. But we believe that our estimate, which is the the decommissioning costs themselves, has a sufficient. Um, contingency on top of it and effectively what happened as we went back and forth on this was an additional six almost seven million dollars of contingency was added to our decommissioning estimate um, and you know that is going to sit in an LC or a letter of credit over the course of 30 years and adds a lot of cost to the project and we don't necessarily think that it's it you know the arbitrary 10 percent or 20 percent is is justified um, we believe that you know our experts who are you know, well versed in decommissioning, that that their amount should stand on their own, and so we just wanted to put that into the record. We believe that the the amount as presented by Capital Power, which is still in the thirty million dollar range, um, I think it might have been thirty two million dollar range, is sufficient. But once you add an additional six to seven million dollars, and it's almost thirty nine million, that it really compounds compounds itself over time. And and to have a letter of credit, whether it's 32 or 39 sitting in the bank, we do think the state is like fairly protected because at the end of the day, Capital Power, publicly traded company, large balance sheet, we're gonna be able to stand behind and, and take down this facility when it comes time. 
but the seven million dollars compounded over time adds like many millions of dollars unnecessarily. So we just wanted to put that in the record. Any questions? I don't have my video on, I guess. I need to put my video on. Yeah. Yeah, hold on just one second. <coughs> Cindy Condon, and I have a question. So, um, in the, just with respect to that, especially the decommissioning and the cost, could you explain a little bit about the hierarchy, capital power versus Nolan Hills? Yep. Um, Nolan Hills is the applicant, I understand it, and capital, but everything refers to capital power and we're depending on your balance sheet and your financials. Um, but Nolan Hills remains the applicant of record, right? Correct. So could you explain how to, um, to be comfortable with the balance sheet, having that balance sheet and yes. your standing behind Nolan? Yeah. So, um, we, we acquired a company called element power, which is based was based in Portland, Oregon. We, we acquired that LLC, which Nolan Hills was a part of, and we've kept that structure in place. But at the end of the day, um, capital power, uh, we actually have a, um, a parent company in Canada, capital power corporation. And we also have a holding company in the U S that's called capital power U S holdings. And so capital power corporation is the rated entity. Everything flows back up the chain to capital power, which is the publicly traded company that has, you know, lots of shareholders. It's, it's the project that's on the Toronto stock exchange. It's what S and P rates in terms of financial capability. And so Nolan Hills wind LLC is a subsidiary of capital power. And so anytime we put a bond in place or a letter of credit in place, whether if it's in Canada, it's from capital power corporation. If it's in the U S it's from our U S holding company. That's what the letter of credit is going. Like when we put a $32 million or $39 million letter of credit in place, it's going to be capital power holdings as our, as the entity that is standing behind that. And that's because that's the company that has the wherewithal to, to pay $32 million when it comes time. And so it is a, it's a fully owned subsidiary. Um, and we believe that that's ultimately who will stand behind the project. I don't know. Does that answer your question? Um, yes. Um, but in the, in the, um, materials, mm -hmm. there's certainly no guarantee that, or there's nothing that says that I have read that, um, says capital power stands behind it stands behind Nolan Hills. And I just want to get comfortable with that, that that's a firm statement on your part, that capital power is really the entity. Correct. Capital if power is the entity. Okay. That's who I work for. That's who will ultimately fund this project. And, uh, you know, when this project is obtaining revenues and, and paying the bills, it'll all run through capital power. And so the capital power itself has been around for a long, long time. We were the municipally owned utility in Edmonton. It's been around since 1896. Mm -hmm. And so we, we are very confident we'll be around when it comes time to decommission this facility. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, great. Any other questions from council before we move on? Okay. Um, are we then ready to move on to public comment? All right. So. Um, as I indicated earlier, we're going to start with public comment from uh, participants who are in person in Pendleton there. And um, <clears throat> I think we have seven people who are going to comment. Uh, as I mentioned, you'll have five minutes apiece. Don't feel like you need to use all five minutes if you don't want to, but that's kind of our the limit. Um, so, Kathleen, whenever you're ready, if you want to. Have the first person come up and introduce themselves. Thank you. For the record, this is Katie Sloan. Um, I just want to check the room. I know a couple of people came in after we got started to see if there was anybody who hasn't given me a comment card that wants to comment. Okay, so I believe we have eight. Eight, okay. So the first commenter, um, 
I'm going to call on is Mr. Chuck Little. My name is Chuck Little. The spelling is C-H-U-C-K-L-I-T-T-L-E. I live at 17 Westview Drive, Hermiston, Oregon. I'm here today in support of the Nolan Hills Wind Project. Uh, the Nolan Hills Winds Project is going to be one of the few renewable green energy projects in Oregon that will have wind, solar, battery storage from the beginning of the permitting process. The 300 megawatt wind energy components comprised of 112 wind turbine generators make the bulk of the project. The 260 megawatt solar array will include approximately 8, 816,812 solar modules and battery storage system. There will be approximately 120 megawatts of battery storage. This part, this part could cover up to 1,800 acres. 96 acres or 2.96 square miles, depending on the final technology and lay layout selected for the project. This portion of the project will be enclosed with eight foot tall security fence. Projects like this need to be moved forward to meet the supply of renewable energy in Oregon. With the passage of Senate Bill 1547 in 2016 that mandates that 50% of Oregon's electrical needs be provided by renewable sources by 2040. I'm urging the Oregon Energy Siding Council to approve this project so that Oregon can move forward in its clean energy mandates. Um, also, a few comments that I've heard. Um, I know the FSEC Council does a very good job of re reviewing these application projects, and I think they will be sure that any concerns raised in any of these meetings will be hashed out before that certificate is issued. So thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you, Mr. Little. Are there any questions uh, for Mr. Little? Okay, I'm not hearing any. We can go ahead and move on to uh, the next person. Okay, the next person is Mr. James Peters. Good evening, man. Good evening, members of council. Thank you for letting me speak this evening. My name is James Peters. It's J A M E S P E T E R S. I'm a member of Labor's Local 737. I'm in support of the Nolan Hills Wind Projects because I've worked a few renewable projects in Oregon. I believe they are a win win for Oregon. We can harness green energy and we also provide money back into our communities by creating good paying jobs for Oregon residents. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peters. Can you um, provide your Either your email or your address. Yeah, uh, J Peters at Leuna and ROCK dot org. All right, thank you. He also provided his address on the oh. testimony. Okay, slip. My, my apologies. No, that's fine. I just wanted you to know that. Okay, who's next? Mr. Eric, I believe it's Anson. Anson? Anson? Oh, you said no. Okay. Okay. He submitted written comment. Should I read them or should I? Okay. All right. I have another one. Okay. Uh, Jody Parker. Parker. Okay. All right. So you didn't take a swing at that middle name there. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I couldn't read it. Oh, well, that'd be my handwriting then. Uh, well, welcome to Pendleton. Uh, uh, Chair Grail, Vice Chair Howe, uh, Council members, uh, good afternoon again. Welcome. It's been quite a long time since we've been able to sit in council like this, isn't it? How exciting is this? So thank you for taking the time to be out here and to listen to my testimony. I am Jody Getzlow Parker. I'm a business rep with Laborers International Union of North America, Local 737. Uh, we represent roughly 3,000 men and women in the uh, state of Oregon who work as construction craft laborers. <clears throat> we work as a voice uh, for our members across the state, ensuring that we have fair and equitable labor agreements, the best education through our training centers as possible, and apprenticeship opportunities for our diverse communities. 
One of our state strengths is our commitment to investments in green energy or the renewables. Uh, through wind, solar, multimodal transportation options, and biofuels, to just to name a few, uh, I feel that our great state leads the pack with innovations uh, to ensure we grow to a healthier place as we move forward to our future. The opportunities that a project like this will build our region both economically and by providing a training source for careers that are successful and fulfilling. As it's known, the Nolan Hills Wind Power Project will be good for Oregon's renewable infrastructure, the economy, and put Oregon's Oregonians back to work. The Nolan Hills Wind Power Project should go through a careful review by our professional regulators to ensure compliance with their ex existing laws. However, we should never put up roadblocks to the hundreds of middle class jobs and financial support that this kind of energy will bring to Oregon. This project will provide uh, important short and long term uh, boost to our regional economy. economy. Uh, the proposals will create jobs in construction, transportation, and trades in both the blue collar and the white collar workers. Just as important, the projects like uh, this strengthen our tax bases for our local economies and that have been hit so hard by this recent pandemic. And thank everybody for coming through this. Uh, we are seeing signs of life in our urban areas, but our rural areas, the impact clearly still lingers. Uh, the projects and jobs create new revenues for our schools and other vital services. There was a time, quite a long time ago, years ago, that we lacked our knowledge, the technology, the tough environmental laws and procedures to achieve both a strong economy and a clean, safe environment. I'd like to think that those days are behind us, thanks to technology, the tough environmental laws are best practices from business and workers alike, including the public oversight that we see here today. We can achieve both a clean environment and a growing economy. I know our organization is committed to both these principles. In the end, we do have a choice. We can scrutinize and support this project, or we can put up low roadblocks and watch the jobs and the community benefits walk away. I urge you to apply due diligence to the S oversight and to see the compliance of the principles offer, then embrace the opportunities that they create for our fellow Oregonians. Stutter, stop, stutter. Uh, please move the Nolan Hills Wind Power Project forward. I want to again thank you for, your con for listening to my testimony, your considerations to this project, and of course your service to the state of Oregon. Thank you so much for your time. I would entertain one question. As many as you have, actually. <laughs> See none. I'll just walk away quietly. <laughs> Thank you all. Do we, do we need um, any spellings or addresses? Oh, or I think it's on the form. You, okay, perfect. You Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so then I think we're ready for our next um, participant. So our next speaker is John Tay Clardy. Hello, my name is uh, Jante Clardy, uh, spelled J-O-N-T-A-E, uh, C-L-A-R-D-Y. Um, I am a, uh, a, um, a laborer, uh, 737. Um, I worked uh, um, half my career in the, the union. I'm proud to say that I've uh, built a many progressive uh, energy efficient projects, and I'm here today to voice my uh, support with, for the Nolan Hill uh, Wind projects, um, all the renewable uh, projects that uh, can build these uh, great states and service to Oregonians through uh, family wage jobs, health benefits, and pensions, and which uh, also helps the local economy and supports infrastructure, um, educational needs, and our training program, and other further uh, humanitarian uh, work. Uh, so please affirm this project, and uh, again, thank you for your time. Um, and uh, again, my name is John T. Clarity, uh, local 737. We have it on his comment card. And again, she has my address and everything on his <laughs> comment card. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Clarity. All right. Who do we have next? Mr. Scott West. And we do have his address. Thank you.
Good evening. Presiding officer and council members, my name is Scott West, S-C-O-T-T-W-E-S-T, and I am here uh, representing Quail Run Ramus Ranches and Echo owners, Sam Ramus, who is in the room, and uh, my uncle and my mom, Margaret Jean West. And so we want to make some uh, comments. Uh, we um, provided the comments to you already. Uh, this is a follow up to a letter that we um, submitted on, I think, April 22nd, which was a few days after the original letter came out. Um, and generally, our response that we're generally um, we're not opposed, but we had some questions about communication, and we also had some questions that we believed as the site map showed of that BPA corridor that comes across our property, that um, there were some siting questions around uh, just on the easement and also some siting questions perhaps around the potential substation. So we wanted to make sure that those um, questions were uh, addressed. I'm happy to report since the period of time and why I'm here this evening is that since that period of time, we had the opportunity to meet with Kimberly from Capital Power and also Matt. And I think that uh, getting on site and going across those um, across the ground and looking at that really, I think, was very, very helpful for us. And also, I think, very helpful for, I will say that on our behalf, um, Matt can speak for himself. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that that we uh, we thought the meetings were beneficial and were very helpful. Uh, we've been on that ground since 1906, so long time uh, residents in the community and equally as interested in not only what happens, you know, certainly with our property, but, but the broader economic and social and all the rest of it with regard to not just on our property, but within the whole, within the region, but also in the state of Oregon. So um, with that, I will conclude my comments, um, my address and, and, uh, and the contact information is on this letter. And uh, I know my uncle's uh, information is on the letter that was provided before. So uh, once again, thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to be before you this evening and uh, happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. Thank you, Mr. West. I don't have any questions. Any questions from council? That is sweet. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. The last comment card I have is Mr. Art Pryor. I do have your street address, but you didn't mention which town you're from. <laughs> Hi, um, my name's Art Pryor. I'm from Echo, Oregon, from Eagle Ranch. My last name is spelled P-R-I-O-R. I am here in support of the project, but I do have a um, a mild concern that the um, the description of the path to get hooked up to the grid needs to be defined um, and cemented or monumented that that we don't deviate from that very much simply because our farm is in that corridor and if a, a simpler or a cheaper way to get to the grid would fac facilitate going through our farm it would probably cause me some economic Harm if uh, power lines would go through our through our irrigated farm, and that that's the only concern that I have. Uh, generally, we're we're very supportive of the, of the project and um, um, would like to see it go through. And um, um, any questions? No questions from me. Anything from council? Yeah, I'm not able to hear. Okay, Kate, we're trying. There we go. Now we're cooking. Perfect. Back up a Thank you. Bit. Okay. Better turn it off. There we go. We won't get a repeat. Mr. Pryor, yes, um, irrigated cropland on your property. Is it all irrigated or just give me an idea if the transmission line doesn't conform to the existing proposed route? All the information that I have and that we have indicates that it's going to go down to the existing right-of-ways that Umatil Electric has. And I, and I guess that's what I would like to see and not deviate from that plan because it would be very 
advantageous to cut through irrigated, yes, and to answer your question, yes, it would be very advantageous to cut through irrigated real estate to shorten the route, uh, which would okay. cause me economic loss. Okay. Thank you. That's what I needed to understand. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, thanks. Okay, any other questions? All right, thank you, Mr. Pryor. So I just wanted to check to make sure there were no additional commenters in the room and then if none does not appear that there are, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, so I think we need to figure out who on. Oh, you have something else going on. Okay. We need to figure out who on WebEx is going to testify or provide comments. Um, Miss Kathleen, how do you recommend they do that? That they raise their hand on WebEx if they want to comment? Yes, there's a WebEx feature that is the raise your hand if you want to comment. And the way you get to it is to open the participant box. And then you'll see how you can raise your hand. Do you have one person with their hand up? You do. Okay. I can't see the I can. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Nancy because Nancy can see who's raising their hand. I can't. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Kate. I do have Dick, Dixie Eclavera with her hand up. So I'm going to go ahead and open your mic if you wanted to go ahead and make a comment or have a question. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we yes. can hear you. Um, so my name is Dixie Echeverria. I'm with and the last name is spelt just as it's uh, stated on the screen. E is in Edward, C is in Cat, H is in Henry, E is in Edward, V is in Victor, E is in Edward, R R I A. I'm an owner in ELH LLC, a property that is um, it looks like the transmission line is wanting to go across. We are a small irrigated agricultural farm, but we also overlay with a um, dense agricultural um, commercially permitted um, permit through um, Oregon Department of Ag. And we would just ask that um, if they could utilize the transmission or utilize the public right of way for the transmission line. There's already one from another wind farm. Uh, that utilizes Highway 207. Um, if they aren't able to use that, then we would just ask um, due to the other overlying um, utilization on our farm that they go to um, adjoining properties either to, so one would be to the south of ours, which would be Simplot Farms, which I think Cunningham, I'm not sure, but one of the shareholders of um, the owners of uh, Cunningham Sheep has a relationship with. And then I think the farm to the, let's see, to the east of us is, um, they also have a renewable wind energy already permitted on that farm as well. Um, it would just, uh, a transmission line of any, um, you know, once one goes through, if there was more needed, it would really complicate um, the current and long term use that is currently permitted um, on our farm. Uh, and then also one other thing I was going to ask was that if um, it is cited that I think that they had mentioned that they were going to use the current poles that were there, there are single poles, but we would just ask that they um, continue to maintain a monopole structure for a 230 KV line, transmission line. And then I have real reservations about the, the use of the UEC easements. UEC is a um, very old co-op in our area. And oftentimes those easements are um, blanket easements. They're often very wide um, and broad sweeping 
um, easements. And this would be, I would imagine at this point in time, um, it would be a very outdated practice, if not obsolete. And, and so I have real, um, I would request uh, hesitation to utilize these types of easements. And the, I guess they would need new easements anyways. So. Okay, thank you. Cece, was that everything you wanted to cover? Yes. And just remind me again, how do you say your last name? It's Echeverria and I'm with ELH LLC and my name is Dixie. Dixie. And um, would you, can you provide a phone number, or sorry, an email address or a mailing address for us? Um, you guys have a mailing address for us. That's how we were notified of this through ELH LLC. And then I have also emailed comments to uh, Mrs. Sloan. Okay. Um, Kathleen, do you have what you need for that or do you need it again? I am not sure I received her email. I do not recall it. I can check and I, see. It was sent today and it um, would have been from oh, Columbia okay. Feeders at Yahoo. Okay. I can, can look at my. Just one more time. Can you just, so we make sure that you get what you need. Can you just state your, your email address? It's Columbia Feeders at Yahoo. And, and I, I do have it. It just came through at 6.02. Oh, okay. So after the hearing started. So, yes, I have your, I have your email and your comment. So it'll get added. Okay, great. Thank you, Ms. Echeverria. Um, all right. Is there anyone else on WebEx who wants to provide comments? Uh, if so, you can raise your hand. So I think we were going through here. Um, if you're on WebEx, the bottom right side of your screen, there's a little... Um, Looks like the top half of a person with three lines. That's your participant panel. If you click on that, that'll open up the participants. And then at the bottom part of the participant panel, there's a little hand. Um, and that's how you raise your hand. So I don't see any other hands raised. Nancy, are you seeing any? Oh, I see no hands. Okay. All right. Is there anybody on the phone who uh, wants to provide any comments? Um, can they unmute themselves, Nancy, if they're on the phone or how, how do they do that? Um, I would have to unmute them, but I do not see anybody. I don't see anybody. Can they raise their hand if they're on the phone or? Um, they actually need to press star three on their telephone keypad to raise their hand. And they can press okay. star three again to lower their hand. Okay, so if there's anybody on the phone who wants to make a comment, press star three. I'm gonna wait just a couple moments to let anybody do that who needs to. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. All right. Okay, well, I've seen no hands go up um, for any other comments on WebEx or by phone. Um, just want to do one final call. If anyone wants to make a comment at this point in person or by phone or WebEx, this is your opportunity to do so. Uh, so I need you to make yourself known now. Okay. Um, all right then. So does the council have anyone with the council have any questions or comments they wanted to make at this point for 
to the applicant or at all any anything you want to put on the record for this hearing. This is Hanley Jenkins council. Did you get that Kate? No, I heard I heard a name. I heard Mr. Jenkins, but I didn't catch anything else. Okay. So, um, my organization is the Energy Facility Siding Council, and um, I'm a council member. And my name is Hanley, H A N L E Y Jenkins, J E N K I N S. Okay. Do you need anything else on that? Do, do you have any comments you want to put on the record? I do. I have a rather lengthy list. Um, and for the benefit of those that have a copy of the draft proposed order, I'm going to go through that kind of by page uh, reference uh, to my comments. Um, got something, uh, some questions here. So let me pause for a second and see if. Are we good? Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, so my first comment is on page 25, which is under the balancing issue um, that has been raised in the uh, DPO. Um, I do agree um, with the staff that the applicant has not uh, met the criteria for the balancing authority, primarily because um, the two turbines um, that would be affected uh, by the uh, Washington ground squirrel habitat represent only 1% of the uh, generating capacity for the wind farm. Um, and so I, in that case, I do agree with staff on that particular issue. On page 35, um, the, um, there's a, I, and this is an issue that I think we can resolve um, with the staff, but there's a reference to a facility manager or managers versus operation manager. And I think it's the same same person or persons, um, but it's two different terms. And um, I didn't see any definition or reference uh, to the distinction to those. Um, on page 37, um, there's a reference to an on-site batch plant um, and that the on-site batch plant would need a DEQ permit, um, but there's no indication that the on-site batch plant would need a county land use permit. And we kind of, we talked a little bit about that today. Um, I don't know whether there's a resolution of that, but um, it's something that probably ought to be addressed in the draft proposed order. Page 44, um, there's a discussion about um, seismic um, issues. Um, and let me go to that page. So it's uh, the issue is subsidence, um, and um, there is a discussion about non um, seismic related causes to subsidence, um, and there's a geotechnical investigation that's required, um, but the geotechnical investigation only talks about doing the seismic um, issues associated with subsidence, and it doesn't talk about non subsidence. So. There, I'll look at whether or not you need to include non-subsidence um, in that uh, particular condition. Page uh, 60, um, there's the discussion um, about uh, the county's requirement for a two-mile setback from residences. Um, and um, the, the staff has had a rather extensive discussion um, about um, substantive criteria associated with um, the statewide planning goals and whether or not the county's two mile setback meets that requirement. Um, and I think the, the telling uh, focus of that for me was that um, the department therefore recommends council conclude that while criteria number three, um, which is the two mile setback is both allowed by and consistent with goal three, um, it is it is nevertheless not required by goal three. And I agree with that. Um, the, this is a kind of a unusual situation. 
um, where the county has adopted a standard that is greater than what is required by the um, Oregon land use requirements. Um, and it may be allowed, but it's not um, something that's required and it's not a substantive criteria and therefore um, uh, is not, I, I agree, is not a requirement um, for the uh, site certificate. So that gets me to um, the issue um, that uh, Tim um, focused on in his testimony, which is uh, the goal three exceptions process. Um, and that begins on page 114 in the, in the rule. And I'm gonna go through some uh, factual things that I agree with. Um, and, um, and then I wanna get to kind of the crux of where I'm at um, on this issue. So I agree there's 242 acres of high value farm land um, associated with the solar site. So this is in reference to um, the solar facility construction. Um, and there's 100, uh, 1,840 acres of arable land, um, which has been cultivated in the past. Um, and it represents 37.8 or about 38% of the, uh, the landowner's um, crop land um, in their ownership, which I think is fairly significant. Um, and so I think that's important to recognize um, that this area proposed for the solar facility um, does represent a large portion of um, what is cropland on the applicant's property. I accept that it's not um, irrigated nor in an irrigation district. Um, and this year it isn't even cropped, um, but it is arable land uh, by definition. Um, and it has been cropped in the past. Um, I accept that the solar facility uh, would not impact adjacent agricultural operations. We have testimony from adjacent landowners as well as the landowner that owns surrounding property to the proposed solar facility. Um, and on our tour today, um, I, would, I did observe that um, most of that land around there is either fallow uh, cropland or um, it's rangeland. Um, and I accept that there are financial benefits to the landowner um, that could be used to enhance other on-farm agricultural operations. Um, I think you know, that's important, um, but uh, it, I don't think in an, it in, in of itself um, is a basis for um, the exception. Um, not sure that um, we want to be in the business of telling the county how to spend their SIP funds. Um, to assure local agricultural economic benefits from those funds. The applicant alleges um, this site would have the least impact uh, on other on-property uh, cultivated agricultural uses, um, um, but um, there are no identified um, alternatives in the analysis area nor is uh, one required by the FSEC rules. Um, the applicant alleges the solar facility allows for um, integration with the wind facility, but hasn't guaranteed that. Um, and the staff's made that clear um, in, the, in the draft proposed order. And the applicant alleges um, this site would have minimal other environmental impacts um, that may be less than other portions of the subject property, um, but it still will have environmental impacts um, for this uh, particular site. So, point that I've made over the last several meetings about taking an exception to agricultural lands is um, that um, this particular site is in fact cultivated cultivated um, agricultural land or has been cultivated agricultural land and qualifies um, as arable land um, under the uh, State Land Conservation Development Commission administrative rules. Um, and uh, we are taking an exception to statewide planning goal three through this process um, specifically for this 2000 acres. And I think that's the the point that I've been trying to make is why is this particular portion of property um, different than other cultivated property in Umatilla County and Central Oregon? Um, 
And Tim uses the word unique. Um, I don't think it's one of a kind. I think that um, the exceptions process could be met on other properties, but I do think that the reasons that are necessary for justifying the exceptions have to be specific to this particular property. I don't think uh, the applicant has shown why uh, this uh, particular portion of cropland is any different than any other cropland um, in the region. And I think that's where I'm having difficulty um, with agreeing with the exceptions that has been presented to us. And so um, my point is, um, we ha it may not be unique um, as Tim has described, but it has to be, there have to be reasons why this parcel versus any other parcel um, in central and eastern Oregon that is in cultivated cropland um, is, and why is it different? Um, and why should it be um, exempt from protection of agricultural lands um, where other property is subject to those? So that's kind of where I stand on this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jenkins. Is there any other um, council member who would like to be heard? Uh, yes, there is. This is Kent Howe. H O W E. You. And I'm on the council. Oh, we can't hear you. Okay, I can hear you now. Yeah. Um, go ahead whenever you're ready. Go ahead. Okay, I want to uh, follow up on the goal three exception issue as well. And um, I, rather than reiterating what Hanley just said, or Mr. Jenkins, uh, I agree with uh, what uh, Councillor Jenkins has said, and I'm going to try to add a little bit more to it that may help the applicant in getting to um, additional information that I feel we need in order to um, make a finding that the goal three exception uh, has been met. And uh, first of all, taking an exception to goal three uh, has a very high threshold. It, it's the way in Oregon that we allow removing agricultural land from Oregon's agricultural land inventory. Uh, the burdens on the applicant to provide us with adequate reasons from which we can make findings that we can use to adopt our own conclusions of law in support of the application. And um, I don't think unique is the word that um, we want to use here. Um, it, it's not that it's the only place that this could occur, but what are the reasons that sets it aside, this, this location, those uh, 19, roughly 1,900 acres, what sets those 1,900 acres aside from the other 227,300 acres in Umatilla County that's in dry land winter wheat? Otherwise, it's not an exception to the rest of the dry land winter wheat fields in Umatilla County if, it's, if we're not making something that distinguishes it from those other uh, lands. Um, and so maybe it's not the reasons of why it's unique, but the reasons that distinguishes the loss of that agricultural land where the solar facilities proposed is different from the other 227,000 acres that would allow us to take that exception to goal three and justify removing it from Oregon's agricultural land inventory. Um, you know, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's its proximity to the wind turbine facility and the adjacent ancillary facilities. Maybe it's a topography. Um, uh, there needs to be something besides the fact that it's, you know, eight tenths of a percent of, Oreg of the dry land wheat that's harvested in um, Umatilla County of the acreages of dry land wheat that's harvested. And just that statistic doesn't cut it for me. It doesn't really distinguish it from 
those other 227,000 acres of dry land wheat in um, Umatilla County. So that's what I'm going to need in order to be able to say we've got an adequate um, findings to justify an exception to goal three for the acreage uh, that the solar facility would be placed on. That's my comments. Thank you, Mr. Howe. Um, all right, any other comments from council? Okay. Cindy Condon, member of the council. Ms. Condon, go ahead whenever you're ready. Thank you. Mine are going to be sound simple compared to the goal three, three exception. Um, I just want to take the opportunity again to talk about the um, organizational expertise and the findings of fact. And um, if not a deficiency, uh, an issue with me putting together that Nolan Hills is our applicant and throughout the document, actually, um, applicant is used and then capital power is used. And to me, those aren't consistent. Um, and I, there is nothing in the findings of factor, the DPO that suggests to me, other than the comment tonight, thank you very much, um, that capital power is that will stand behind this LLC that today is in name only. And so to me, that's a deficiency in the organizational expertise um, standard. So that's a simple way of saying it. And then if I can just um, move on to um, the decommissioning and the financial um, standard, the responsibility standard. We take um, a comfort letter or review a comfort letter that in this application is received from the Royal Bank of Canada and names again capital power and I understand that and it's um, refers to a specific date that is of March 2nd 2022 and I realize that's probably the date of review that there was significant significant capital financial reserves to to issue a letter for capital power um, this project may, be, may not be due for some time. And for me, that comfort letter doesn't, doesn't provide much comfort, I guess, given the very specific way it was written at a point in time for Capital Power, not whole, Nolan Hills. And um, I, I, I would like to, to strengthen that, I guess, if, even if Capital Power, um, they were the parent company, uh, had a statement on the record uh, uh, document saying that, yeah, we are the responsible entity and our credit facility uh, pertains to this and it is, is available for this. So there you go. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Condon. Okay. Yes. Anyone, what, I'm sorry, did you have anything else? Oh, no, sorry, I didn't. I just thought you had a question of me. Thank you. Oh, no, no, thank you. Okay, anyone else with council? Okay, well, I'm not hearing any. Um, so I just want to check in and make sure that there's no one else that wanted to provide any comments at this point. Um, and then we'll go back to applicant to talk about responses to comments, but anyone in person or on the phone or on Webex that wants to make comments, um, raise your hand or make yourself known. Okay, I'm not hearing any and I don't see any hands raised. Um, okay, so let's um, go back to the applicant, who is going to speak for the applicant in terms of uh, responses to any of the comments received or um, let's see, is that Mr. McMahon, are you the one who just yes. sat down? 
Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Tim McMahon, again, for the record. <clears throat> we would like some um, opportunity to respond to the comments that have been made, and actually we're going to ask for a 30-day continuance of the hearing, leaving the record open for 30 days to give us an opportunity to do that. But before um, we uh, move along here, I would ask Mr. Corey to come back up as a witness and representative of the project and the landowner to provide some additional testimony. Okay. Um, thank you, and and uh, I just had a few comments. Um, one of the difficulties is that uh, I hadn't uh, actually had an opportunity, probably had the opportunity, I didn't get done the review of the full staff report on where it came up with some of the assumptions, but in listening to what I think is would be good and natural questions from the staff report uh, by, uh, by the council, um, I can see a few things that are, that will, have will come back and, and present, but uh, one of the things that's important, I think, about this site because it, it's really very intentionally selected from among the acres that are in the 43,000 acres is that uh, it's the very poorest farmland that we have. And I've harvested uh, uh, grain on this property as a youngster all the way up, and and uh, my brother Doug, who's here, that I mentioned earlier when I testified, uh, both of us can tell you in driving combines through it, if you look at the lands that we have, this is the very poorest field that we've got. It's not a high producing field whatsoever. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> the second thing is it has no water, and we actually were sp selective in making sure that it wasn't something that we would be interrupting any water rights on. I did testify to that. Uh, a third thing is that <clears throat> this seems maybe a little stupid, but uh, uh, the fact is you drive into Pendleton off Reef, Reef Ridge and you see a uh, see a sign that says, uh, watch, watch out for glare, but it doesn't tell you how come. Well, the reason is you're going around a bend and going right into a, uh, a solar project that's owned by the city of Pendleton that's, uh, that's right below the freeway. <laughs> and I sort of always, uh, uh, I got to serve on the, Transportation Commission is similar to you uh, for a number of years, and I don't know how we actually came up with that sign, uh, and uh, I hope it wasn't while I was there, but uh, at any rate, this I can guarantee this site is removed so remote that you've got a piece of property that happens to have the right topography, flat, uh, and the right location next to an existing proposed uh, wind project and right next to where the battery storage and the substation is <clears throat> and also located close to the north end of the property where it's accessible very quickly if you have problems with the solar it isn't as though you've got to drive the extra 10 or 11 12 miles to get to where the wind turbines uh, may be uh, part of them may be uh, so it does have a uniqueness and importance to us in terms of of uh, how and where we cited it and then in terms of the percentages, which I totally agree, and I know how you came up with a 36%, I didn't say anything about it, but that calculation is is not applicable here, but you haven't been told why it isn't applicable. Um, the, the lands that we already have in CRP, and I think we refer to them in my letter, uh, that, uh, uh, but you look at the lands we have in CRP, similar to this land where the solar site's going to go, they've got to be in the figure. But what you're comparing it to is simply apples to oranges. The comparison is this 1,890 acres to the land that we presently do not have uh, in CRP that is cropped. So it's a comparison of that figure with a figure of about 2,600 acres. And I think you add them together and they'll get 42 or 4,300 acres. Well, that is the 36 percent but the fact is if you take all the other crp that you would have seen out there today the figure really is about it's it's around 10 percent because the fields that you go through where the turbines are going to be is also crp and we've selected those and put them in purposely because of the soil protection and the stewardship that uh, we think is a responsibility, just like the government does, of, of society and where we are. But if you're comparing uh, the growing crop lands now in CRP with the site, it isn't 36% or 37%, it's, it's 10. 
11. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, as your vice chair has said, is the standard what we are compared to what we have, or is the standard what we are compared to what the county has? And the county is, I mean, it's 0 0.02 or 0 0.2, or whatever the figure was in your things, but very, very low percent. Um, so anyway, uh, this was selected as a site as the very least minimal impact that we could believe was applicable for a solar site, which as the members of the Hermiston uh, group have said here behind me in the orange shirts, this is an important project we think to have done and have, I mean, it provides everything that we're looking for collectively and it's, and it is a project we worked on and it, and I think it is, although unique is a term that I guess we can interpret several different ways. This is a piece that we think certainly justifies that. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, Mr. McMahon, were you going to make um, any other statements? No, Your Honor. <clears throat> no, Your Honor. Thank you. We would request a continuance for at least 30 days. We'll stick with 30 days. We may come back and seek more time, but I think that should do the trick. Thank you. Okay, so I was looking at the calendar here. 30 days out puts us on a Saturday. Let me see. Uh, Tim McMahon here. Let me correct to the next council meeting. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, and let's see next council meeting. I know that in your opening, you went over that. I don't know what that date is. Could someone remind me? Runner for the record, Todd Cornett, uh, June 23rd and 24th. Okay, um, so I will leave the record open for the applicant to respond to comments and concerns raised today um, and to submit those then by uh, the next meeting. So it looks like that's starting June 23rd. So I'll set the deadline as uh, June 23rd uh, for applicant to respond. Okay, um, I know I've done this several times, but I just want to make sure any other comments from anyone questions um, before we wrap up this evening. Your honor, it looks like uh, Dixie has her hand up again. I'm going to go ahead and unmute her mic if that is good for you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Dixie, uh, your hands up. Did you have something? I, else? That's an error. I have okay. no further comment. All right, okay. thank you. You Just do have one more second. comment in the room. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Uh, for the record, Jody Gessler Parker uh, with the Labor's Local Seven Thirty Seven. Two questions with a uh, with a continuance. Uh, can we? Does that keep the public record comp the comment record open again? And I'm seeing the head shaking. No. In that look, and then my second question goes more towards my own testimony. Uh, can I submit that via email tomorrow uh, when I get tech to find my email program? <laughs> um, what what is it that you want to submit that you haven't told us tonight? Well, no, no, same. Uh, it's just what I read. You got what I what I spoke to this evening. Just uh, the printed version. Submit the printed version, but my, I crashed my email system, honestly. Um, and so I have to talk to IT to repair it. So I can't send it to you today by the close of this meeting. Do you have a printed copy of it that you could hand over? It's flawed. I had to line through a couple of things. So I could give it to you, but if you just excuse the flaws. Oh, I see. Um, Kathleen, you do you have a. Do you have a preference getting it by email or do you just want to hand a hard copy? What would your preference be? 
guess what one thing I would want to mention is that we are recording this meeting. So your testimony, we will have a transcript. Oh, you'll have it on transcript. Yeah. Of course. So if there is additional comment that you did not cover, you could give it to us now or we can yeah. transcribe your comments. Oh, no, that's perfect. Then if you can transcribe my comment, yes. that'll capture it without my scribbles on my paper. Okay. <laughs> yeah. and, and for the record, everybody's comments will be transcribed. So yeah. You guys hear that? Okay. So thank you so much. Jody, it sounds like you were able to tell us everything you wanted to. Yes. Okay. Yes. I addressed everything I wanted to talk about. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Anything else from anyone? Uh, Kathleen, you, or I'm sorry, Jody, you did ask whether the cont the continuance would leave the public record open. The answer to that is no, it's just I'm only leaving the record open to allow the applicant to respond to things that were raised tonight. Um, and and um, your honor, just uh, Tim McMahon here again for um, needing some additional clarification on this point. <clears throat> um, there are at least a couple of issues that came up tonight from the council members, including potentially a need to do a countywide survey um, for lands that may or may not need a goal three exception that is not something i've ever considered was a necessity for goal three exception but we may need some time and we may need some expertise um as witnesses potentially to deal with that issue uh and i because this is truly a new twist that um we're coping with i want to make sure that the record remains sufficiently open for us to potentially bring in some additional witness testimony on this question and it may be additional testimony from the land or almost for sure will be frankly, but, uh, but we may very well need some other consulting resources to assist. Okay, um, so are you asking, I guess I don't quite understand what you're asking me to do or do you yes. want. Yeah, yeah, let me be clear. We asked that the record be left open. For potential additional testimony and evidence at the continued hearing. On June 23rd. Yes. Okay, Miss Sloan, do you have anything you want to add about that or respond to before I take a stab at it? Not. The record, Todd Cornett, I'm going to go to um, Patrick Rowe, DOJ counsel, make sure he's okay with that um, representation. Patrick Rowe with the Department of Justice. The council has general authority uh, under statute 469-470 sub 6 uh, to take any actions that it deems are proper, desirable, desirable for it to carry out its duties. So if council believes that for it to ultimately make a decision on this application, that it would help to have the additional testimony or evidence that Mr. McMahon is referencing, then that would be appropriate. So Mr. Rowe, can I clarify, is that something then that council would vote on or that you would need me to make a ruling on? I think it would be safe as it, it, it council has delegated its authority to uh conduct this meeting to you but never nevertheless i think it would be safest if council did vote on it okay and so the vote then would be whether to allow the record to remain open until june 23rd and then at that meeting take additional testimony from the applicant correct and your your honor if i could say one more thing on this point <clears throat> at this point in time again we've learned new information this evening and were we to proceed without an opportunity to provide this information and evidence, essentially it's a tantamount to a denial of a very important facility. So that is not something um, we're taking lightly and we need the time to respond. Okay, and does the 30 days or approximately 30 days to the next council meeting give you that time? My client says yes. <laughs> okay. I, I guess um, I, I I would say if we have to come back for a further continuous, we can discuss that with Mr. Rowe, but I, I think that we, we should be able to handle this in 30 days. Okay, so does council want to vote on that? I don't know um, your procedure for, for voting on matters like that. 
So this is Hanley, and I think Patrick suggested it, but I don't know that it's necessary. I, you know, it's um, your your require your opportunity to allow the continuance, and I think that's all that's necessary. Okay. Um, Mr. Rowe, are you in agreement or? Yeah, it's it, given that council has delegated its authority to conduct this hearing to you. Council member Jenkins is correct. I believe you would have you, you, you would have that authority to, to grant the request. I'm just trying to, I just suggested it in, in, in an abundance of caution. Well, let me ask council this. Is there anyone on council who objects to my granting? Um, this continuance speak up now. Okay, not in the room. Not in the room. Anyone um, on the phone or Webex want to speak up? Okay, None. so it doesn't sound like there are any objections to that. So what I'll do is I'll grant the continuance to allow um, the applicant to respond to comments, questions, concerns that were raised tonight. Uh, the record will stay open and you can submit those um, either in writing before that next council meeting or Mr. McMahon, it sounds like you're also um, potentially wanting to provide some witness testimony or witness comments at that next meeting, correct? Correct. So in that case, will Mr. Rowe, coming back to you, will I need to be present then at that since we won't be closing the record? I think it would be best unless council decided that they would Take the responsibility for the hearing back from you. Okay, let me just double check my calendar. Is it another evening meeting like this? Yeah, Your Honor, I think we could probably put this on the regular council agenda on Friday. Friday, um, and what time is that meeting on Friday? Uh, they typically start at 830, um, but we could certainly adjust the uh, agenda item uh, if you had some conflicts. So I have a hearing from 930 to 1130 that morning um, on Friday. I could Thursday evening I could do or Monday I could do before 930. So we have a <clears throat> uh, the schedule for Thursday evening and Friday. So it'd probably be better to do it on either of those days. So we could probably set it for the uh, first agenda item in the afternoon on Friday, if that works for you. Okay. And the afternoon, when does what time would that be? Uh, I think we could make that to be you know uh, work with your schedule, but you know looking at probably twelve thirty or one would probably be preferential. Okay. Okay. Um, and that would be Friday, June 24th, correct? Correct. Okay, that will work. So, um, let's plan for that. We, I will come to the June 24th council meeting. Um, I won't be able to join until um, the afternoon portion. So, um, do you want to say, do you want to set a firm time of 1230 or do you want to say 1? Say 1, and then we'll be in touch with you. Um, sometimes agenda items go long or short, so uh, we'll be in touch with you uh, during the prior agenda items to let you know where we're at. Um, but obviously, if you're not available, uh, we will wait for you. Okay. I'll be done. I'll, I'll be able to join by 1. My hearing goes till 1130 and I don't see that going long. Um, okay, so June 24th, 1 p.m., um, I will appear for that meeting as well. And at that point, the applicant can provide any additional uh, responses or testimony that they think is necessary. Mr. McMahon, is that um, sufficiently clear for your, your purposes? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. And thank you, council members. Yeah, thank you all. Mr. Rowe, anything else you think um, we need to address about that? No, I don't think so. Okay. Okay, so then um, I think that's everything 
that I need to go over. So it's 747 uh, PM on May 26, 2022. Um, the public hearing for today on the draft proposed order for the Nolan Hills wind power project uh, is concluding. Uh, the public comment period is concluding uh, and the record is though remaining open for that limited um, item of allowing the applicant to respond. Uh, thank you everyone for your time and your, your patience tonight. Um, that's everything from me. Hey, and um, I will recess the um, meeting for the Energy Facility Siting Council. The time is now 848, uh, 748, uh, and the May 26, 27, 22 meeting of the Energy Facility Signing Council is now recessed until tomorrow morning at 8.30. Thank you, ALJ. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.